Again, as we come together in the great study of the book of Romans, the great book of Romans, I hope it's a great study, but it's a great book of Romans that Apostle Paul has written for the benefit of uh, many of us and knowing the operation of the church and having the solid doctrine that we need and, and many other things that I'm not going to get into right now about that. But I want to go to the Lord in prayer. And then after we do that, I want to go back to verse number 14, the verse we've finished up with, and, and go over it again and carry us into verse number 15 with the right thought in mind. So bow your heads if you would. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you that there's strength in numbers. And Lord, we pray that we'll be able to come together in a way that we'll be able to make a difference in the world. And Lord, there are many things that, that Satan tries to use to hinder us, but we know that you're greater than he. And we know that if we will be obedient to your call and to your will, that you'll take care of the things that we need you to take care of. And we pray that you will do that today in our minds, that we might receive this information, that we might be able to use it in a a positive way to help lead people to Christ. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. All right, as we had been talking about being dead to sin, we're going going over into the subject now of servants to God. And uh, I want to look back at verse number 14 where Paul wrote these words, For sin shall not have dominion over you, but ye are not under the law, but under grace. You see, there isn't ifs, any ifs, ands, and buts in verse number 14 there. It says, he says, sin shall not rule your life, shall not have dominion over you, for you are under the, you are not. Now, now look at that word. And if you, if you take that word not out of there, you get the wrong interpretation and the wrong meaning of the truth of the word of God. It would be, for ye are under the law, but under grace. You see, there are many people that are still under the law because they place themselves under the law. That's not God's plan. That's not God's way. But for you are not under the law, but under grace. And as we, we leave with that thought, I, I mentioned to you that joy and that favor and that kindness of God, that grace of God. As we leave verse number 14 and go into verse number 15, talking about servants to God. Uh, not servants of God, but servants to God. He says, what then? You know, we, got, we start this verse with a question, Paul does. What then? Shall we sin because we are, we are not under the law, but under grace? Again, we see that word, those two words, God forbid. Absolutely not. We do not sin intentionally because we're under grace and not under the law. Uh, he's saying here, shall we continue to miss the mark? Yeah, we, we realize that every one of us are uh, susceptible to the wrong things in life, that, that there are many things that the devil uses, tools that he uses that will lead us astray, will cause us to miss the mark. But do we continue in our life on a daily basis of sinning and, and missing that mark. He says, absolutely not. Uh, God said, uh, God forbid. In, in verse 16, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey or obedience to, his servants are ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But now let's stop there. You, you've got a question mark there. After unto righteousness. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. Other words, if you yield yourself to the things of the world and you are obedient to those things that lust of the flesh that you enjoy, then it, Paul's saying literally here, you're his servants to, uh, you are enslaved to do his will, uh, regardless of whether that be of sin and the death, of eternal death, separation from God, or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but I would like to think more about being a servant unto God instead of being a servant unto Satan and spending eternity separated from God. I cannot imagine any person desiring to live their life in hell separated from God. You know, I once met a man, and this was an ugly man, and this was a big man, and this was a mean man, and 
I was talking to him, and it was one Wednesday afternoon, actually late in the day, and we had a little business, this friend of mine and, and me, and, and I, I invited him to go to church. I was going to Westwood that night. I was going to prayer meeting, and I love Bible study, and I love prayer meetings. I love being with God's people, so I had an opportunity to invite this fella. And he said, uh, I can't do that. I remember the word by word what he said to me. He looked down about two foot at me when he said, I cannot do that. And he didn't say it in a nice way. And I, I said, uh, sure you can. And he said, no, I cannot. And he got a little louder. And I said, well, I don't know why you can't. And he said, let me tell you something. I want you to listen loud and clear to me. There is no place for me in heaven that the devil has a corner spot reserved for me in hell. So I cannot, so don't ever ask me again. And with the Spirit of God giving me the strength and the whatever I needed to be able to say this to that man, I said it. I said, well, that is a shame because no one has to go to hell. You see, he, he chose to be a servant of the devil. And that's what Paul's talking about right here. It's to whom you yield yourself. It's to whom you choose to follow. You either follow God or you follow Satan. There's no in-betweens. I know we commit sin here and there, but I mean literally to follow someone in your life. You have that choice. This man made that choice. He didn't have to. Brings me back to a truth. No one has to go to hell. You choose your eternal destination. But whether of sin and of death or of obedience unto righteousness, verse number 17, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Let's take a look back at that and Again, that, that gives us a golden opportunity to understand that it isn't in any way that we can give ourselves glory or credit or, or anything uh, as far as, as being saved, as far as being no longer uh, those children of the devil, but we can thank God for that uh, because we were once servants of sin. You see, I once didn't care anything about God, didn't care anything about church, didn't know anything really about God except that he existed, and I believed that because I'm not blind and I'm not a fool. I look around, I can see the very handiwork of God everywhere I look, and, and I, just, uh, you know, I just know there's a God, but I didn't, I didn't have any regard for God. I didn't have any regard for Jesus Christ, and I was, a, I was under sin. I was a servant of sin, and and, when, and didn't care. I, I had no problem with that. And one day somebody, I heard somebody preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit convicted me that I was that servant of sin. And, and I got saved. And you know, I've been saved ever since. And I haven't been the same person ever since. I still have my problems. But I can thank God for that. And I do thank God for that on a daily basis. And, and Paul is saying that we need to do that because God be thanked. Uh, but uh, that, that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. You see, we gave heed. Those of us that have been saved when we obeyed, we gave heed and we followed and we yielded to that doctrine, that form of teaching which was delivered to us about the good news of Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says, being then made free from sin. You see, right then, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I got that free pardon from sin right then in my life. I was not made perfect, but I was no longer a bond slave or the bondage of sin. But I became the servants of righteousness. Uh, verse number 19 said, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to the righteousness and unto holiness. Well, we need to be different. 
I mean, we've talked about this. We've repeated this. He says that I speak after manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. In other words, the infirmity, the sickness of the human life, for as ye have yielded in past times your members, servants, to uncleanness. In past times you didn't have that moral life you, you yielded yourself to the uncleanness of the world, your members servants to that, and to iniquity, transgression of the law. You see, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and holiness. You know, we get a, satis a sanctified life from Jesus Christ. We've already went over that. Sanctification translated holiness. You see, when we become sanctified, the holiness entered into our bodies. We become part of God, and God became part of us. He literally lives inside of this old body. And so we were sanctified, translated holiness, and we become a holy creature. Uh, we need to be careful sometimes about telling how holy we are because a lot of people will get this idea that your holier than thou attitude means that you're better than they are. Well, we're not better than anybody. We're better off than a lot of people because we know Jesus Christ and they don't know Jesus Christ. But we have to deal with the things of the world. We have to deal with the sicknesses of the world. We have to deal with the deaths of loved ones. We have to deal with all kinds of things in this world. But we have that, that God, that Holy Spirit dwelling in us to help us get through these things that we deal with. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. And no question about that, you didn't live a righteous life. You were a bond slave to sin, and you had that righteousness was not in you. But verse number 21 says, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Uh, in other words, uh, what kind of... Uh, uh, I don't know what kind of a happiness, what kind of a, uh, fruit did you have to show in those things where you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. You see, we need to be separated from the old man. We need to do that in the way that we live. Uh, we don't need to just go talk about what we're doing for God or what God has done for us. We need to do that. But along with that, we need to have that living example that backs up the words that we say. Uh, it's easy to call yourself something and be something else. I, uh, I know that I, have, I had one time a, a Ford truck. Now, I could call that truck a Cadillac, but it would still be a Ford. It wouldn't be a Cadillac. So we need to live. We need to be branded. We need to be seen as a child of God. We need to show Jesus Christ through our life. We are ashamed and should be ashamed of those things that we did before Christ, before Christ came into our life. Uh, also in verse number 22, by now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Wow. We take a look at that and wow, being made free from sin. In other words, being given the liberty to serve God and to be a child of God, we became servants to God. You know, the Apostle Paul is about the best example I can think of in the fact that once he got saved, he was sold out to Jesus Christ. He was a servant to God from that very second that he got uh, converted on that road to Damascus until that final breath that he took in his physical life, he was sold out completely to being a servant to God. I use him as an example all the time on that because like I've said previously, I've never known a man or even heard of a man that was sold out as completely as Paul. I hope there is some, and I hope if there is, I'll someday get to meet them on this earth. But we need to be servants to God. He has not called us to be part of Him and not do the things that need to be done. We're not called to sit back and do nothing. I believe that God has a purpose for every one of His children, and I need, I believe, it needs to be that fruit unto holiness, and then we have that everlasting eternal life. 
Verse number 23, very well known by our people, for the wages of sin is death. But you have that conjunction word, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Remember, the wages of sin, the result of missing the mark, are, is eternal death. Separation from God. But the result of the grace of God, the gift of God, is everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Isn't that marvelous? that we can end the sixth chapter with such a great verse of scripture showing us, but if we've received that gift of God, Jesus Christ in our life, that wonderful, wonderful free gift to us that was such a high cost to the Father, uh, we can have eternal life. As we move on, we move on to chapter number seven. We're going to try to get in a little bit of that before the end of the lesson today. We'll be talking about re being released from the law. Uh, know ye not, is the words of Paul, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, uh, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But, uh, but if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. Let's go back to verse number one and take a better look at that where he says, Know ye brethren, uh, he's interested in his brothers. You know, Paul loved his brethren, uh, the brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, it is such a marvelous thing to be able to call somebody, truly call them your brother or your sister in Christ. I remember on this subject, uh, as Paul has, has opened up my mind and my remembrance of this, that my wife, she got so involved in church work that she was around church people most of the time. And it was a constant thing. How are you doing today, brother? How are you, sister, or brother this, or sister that? That she'd be talking to somebody that knows nothing about God, nothing about Jesus Christ, and she would call them brother or sister. And I took her to the side one day, and I said, Sherry, don't be doing that. And she said, what? And she was doing it so uh, subconsciously that she didn't realize it. I said, they have to know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior before they become your brother or sister because they're not your brother or sister in the physical life, so you don't need to refer to them. That's misleading. And I think that's very important that we not include the lost people into our family as brothers and sisters, but that we long for them to be our brothers and sisters in Christ by setting an example and giving them the good news of Jesus Christ in our testimony and in our words. But for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law, the assignment of the law, hath rule over, dominion over, a man as long as he liveth. He's asking the question, uh, do you not know this? And, and then verse 2 goes into this thing about for the woman which hath a husband is tied or bound by the law. You see, we're talking about the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. In other words, she is freed to marry somebody else when her husband is deceased. But I don't want to get into a whole lot of that because there's so much controversy here. But we need to look at what the Word of God says. We don't need to ignore it, no matter how much controversy comes from any of it. We need to keep it straight. We need to keep it like God wrote it and, and not try to steer ourselves around it. But in verse number 3, he, Paul says, so then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress, named an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free or separated from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. In other words, according to the law, she is freed from that. She is not an adulteress. But if that husband is not dead, the law is saying that she is an adulterer, adulteress if she marries another man while he's still living. All right, we go on to verse number four. Wherefore, my brethren, 
ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Other words, you are no longer under the law, but you're under the grace of God. You're under the law by the body of Christ. You're dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Let's go on down to verse number 6. Verse number 5, chapter 7, Romans. For when we were in the flesh, the humanly body, the motions of sin, in other words, the passions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. You know, there are very many things, and one of the things that the devil uses to draw somebody away from God and to cause them to stray in their life for God is this uh, thing uh, of the, the, the motions, the passions of the sins which were by the law that work our members to bring forth fruit unto death. In other words, he, he draws us into these things and then we are bringing forth fruit separated from God. And verse number six says, but now we are delivered from the law. You see, Paul just keeps on nailing down this difference between grace and, and, and the law. Uh, but now we're delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we were held, and that we should serve in newness. In other words, we should be living a completely different life as a child of God than when we were outside of Christ, without Christ, uh, in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter of the law. You see, inward man, uh, a believer, that, that, that Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us, we are new by that, by the death of Jesus Christ and the, and the Holy Spirit indwelling us and not in the oldness of the letter of the law. Are many people now that they, their, their lives are guided still by the law and they're still just as wrong as they were then because it's always been Jehovah's sacrifices. If you want to talk about eternal heaven and you want to go to eternal heaven, it's by the sacrifice of his son Jesus that we are able to get there. And no other way, no doubt about it, Without Jesus Christ, you'll go to hell, and with Jesus Christ, you will go to heaven. There ain't no doubt about it. In verse number seven, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Wow. Again, we see God says forbid. There's no way that you should think this way. Absolutely not. Nay, I had not known, I had not under, understood sin, but by the law. If I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Well, we look at that in verse number seven. What well, shall we say is that law sin? God forbid. Nay, had I not known or understood sin, but by the law, the active and individual desire resulting from the diseased condition of the soul, that sin, that lust, for I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not desire in a bad sense. You see, that's what sin and coveting is all about. We have that desire in a bad sense. It's all right for us to desire things, but let's desire things that God wants us to have, things that are good for us in our life. Uh, let's pause a minute. If you, you need to, I would ask you to pardon me for that interruption right there, but there was a reason that we had to pause for just a moment. But let's, let's get our minds back into what we were talking about and get back into verse number 8 where Paul said, But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. I have a hard time with that word, but it means forbidden. Uh, for without the law, sin was dead. 
For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. You see, for sin taketh occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Uh, wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just. And let us take a good look. The commandment is holy and just and good. It's God's high standard that he has set for us to live the right life. You see, to be holy, we must be set apart from the sins of the world and set apart to God. Set apart from the world, set apart to God. That's what holiness is all about. And that is which is good. And we need to understand that God has the highest standard that there is. And when we look up to the exalted God and the standard that he has for us, that is the goal that we need to take for each one of us to try to reach that standard. Whether we ever make it in this life or not, we should have that goal. Just like Paul had that goal of crossing the finish line. And we need to do that. We need to have that goal to reach that standard of God. Verse number 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. Again we see that. But sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good. Separating. Killing the old sin nature in my life. That sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. In other words, sin by the law does appear sin. May God bless you as we finish this portion of this lesson today. May he take care of you and bring you back with a fresh mind as we go into the next subject of the sin nature still remains.